Hi everyone, I'm Philip Shields. One of my favorite meals is fruit salad. I love fruit salad. My wife knows that we always have lots of fruit around the house. Apparently God loves fruit as well. And when he created Adam, which means dirt, we're dirt, <laughs> dust you are, dust you shall be turned to. When he created Adam, he created him outside the garden and then put him into a beautiful garden full of fruit trees. And so let's read there in Genesis 2, verse 7. Uh, Jehovah God, the Lord God, for man, every time you read the word man in Genesis 2 and 3, the word is actually Adam, Adam. And so uh, when God formed Adam, man, of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being or soul, our Creator did not breathe into the life or, or breathe into any other animals. It's recorded. It's just mankind. And when he breathed into Adam, I think he was putting in what we would call the spirit in man into Adam. It makes us different from other animals. We're not animals. We're not. We're not of the animal kind. We're of the human kind. And we humans have a brain that allows us with the spirit in man to have a mind. But God breathed into Adam and um, I have a sermon on spirit and man, if you want to learn more about it. He was of the earth, earthy. And what he could see was a lot of beautiful fruit all over, the, all over the garden. And he was told by God he could eat of all the fruit he wanted, of all the different trees, except one. You know the story. Genesis 2, verses 8 and 9. Jehovah God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man. I believe Adam was created outside the garden, and then God invited him into his presence. That Garden of Eden was actually laid out in a way that represented what would later become the temple and the tabernacle, or the layout. And out of the ground, Jehovah Elohim made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight. Nice way of saying we're beautiful trees and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It wasn't just evil. It wasn't just a, and, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was also a beautiful tree with beautiful fruit. Not the way I see it described and painted and illustrated in some children's books sometimes. It's a horrible tree. Genesis 2 verse 15, then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden, like I'm saying, to tend it, to keep it, to guard it, okay? And Jehovah God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil don't eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And a day with God is as a thousand years, and Adam lived to be about 930 or so, if I remember right. You know the rest of the story. They failed. Eve ex uh, explained to the serpent, got into a discussion with her worst enemy, that they could eat the fruit of the trees except one. And he questioned that, made her question God. And uh, Adam didn't stop her. Adam didn't be the leader he was supposed to be. Uh, he was the one who was given all the instructions. Eve hadn't been created yet when God spoke to Adam. If you go back and read the story, he should have said, Eve, we're not talking to that whatever that is. And you, whoever you are, get out of here. I've been assigned to keep, guard, and protect this garden. Get out. Yelva, God, Elohim, I need your help. Someone's here. That's what he should have done. He should have pulled Eve away. So you've all heard about God's Holy Spirit and of the fruit of the Spirit. I just want to introduce you where fruit is first introduced in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3. And I want to focus on that fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, of that Spirit, and why it's so important to bear fruit and how, that, how it comes about. On the day of Pentecost, Pentecost, I've been told for years and years, meant, means count 50. It means 50. It does not mean count 50. I've studied it carefully. It's 50. And because it was 50 days from the weekly Sabbath that falls in the Days of Unleavened Bread after the Passover, from, the, from that Sabbath, you count 50 days that brings you to Pentecost, which will always be on the first day of the week. This holy day is also called Feast of First Fruits. It's called 50 Pentecost. It's called Feast of First Fruits, referring to the first early harvest of wheat. We believers are the first fruits of God, according to James 1.18. So this holy day, probably as much as any, uh, refers to 
uh, God working with us as first fruits. It's also called the Feast of Weeks, or in Hebrew, Shavuot, which means weeks. And again, there were seven weeks of Sabbath plus a day, so the true Pentecost will always land on a Sunday, for, or the first day of the week, as I prefer to say, for they were to count to the day after the Sabbath, as, as Leviticus 23 says. Now, on, the, on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no begettal into the family of God. Without the Holy Spirit, you have no seed of God, as mentioned in 1 Peter. The divine nature. Uh, without the Holy Spirit, you can't understand Holy Scripture. Without the Holy Spirit, you have no power and strength and ability to really obey God properly. Neither can we be led by God without it. I have a sermon you might be interested in called 22 Things the Holy Spirit Does. Uh, I was very tired when I recorded that, but I think the information is solid. T just type in the search bar 22 Things and it will pop up. We should talk more often about God's Spirit. The early church, uh, we read about them. They were filled with the Spirit. How many times have we discussed among ourselves, some of you say Spirit-filled meeting or Spirit-filled preaching or Spirit-filled congregation, but I don't hear it very often. So in the early church, it does say they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So in, in between Passover and um, Pentecost, Yeshua, Jesus, was telling his disciples certain things in Acts 1, verses 4 and 5, and verse 8, which we'll read. Acts 1, verses 4 and 5, And being assembled together with them, this is after he was resurrected, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you've heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, you're going to be immersed. You're going to be baptized, not sprinkled, immersed with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. And then jumping to verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses of me, or to me, in Jerusalem, all of Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. God intended to certainly bring in Gentiles, not just Jews. So, what happened on Pentecost? A few verses later, Acts 2, verses 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost, the day of 50, had, fi had fully come, they were all with one accord. They were all united. They were all speaking the same thing. They were working together. They were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, almost maybe like a tornado. A tornado kind of a sound. It filled the whole house. They weren't outside. They were in a house. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there, then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Not just the twelve apostles, upon each of them. There were 120 here this day. And they were all filled. Again, not just the apostles, as some preach. No, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I have a sermon on speaking in tongues. Uh, this is not the sermon for it. I'm talking about the fruit of the Spirit here. They were all acting united, unified. They were one. And being one, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It's often used to describe the uh, people of God in the early church. And as I'm talking about this, let's post, just post a whole bunch of those places where it talks about the church being filled with the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit bears fruit. That's my focus today. Man's nature produces works of the flesh. And the fruit or works of our flesh is pretty ugly stuff. But the fruit of God's Spirit actually describes God. And He wants us looking and being and more like Him more and more each day. Let's turn to Galatians 5 now. Galatians 5 verses 16 to 26. Galatians 5, verses 16 to 26. Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I want you to remember that verse, because we're talking about how we're going to receive the fruit of the Spirit. And he says one way, he voices it or words it this way, walk in the Spirit. Be close enough that 
You can feel God's spirit with you and in you, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It means you got to listen to it too. If God's spirit is saying, don't go in there, don't turn that channel on, don't watch that stuff, don't, uh, those people are not good for you, I would move over here instead. Walking in the spirit means you're following the lead also of the Holy Spirit. And you're asking God to lead you. For the flesh lusts or works against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so you don't end up doing the things you wish. So though God has given us a new nature, we still have the old nature as well. We still have the evil heart, the carnal heart that is not very friendly to God, but we also have a new heart from God. We have a new nature. These are in contact, constant contact, constant war. Verse 18, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And now the works of the flesh are evident. If you see people doing these things, they're doing the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, that's sex after marriage, adultery, fornication, sex outside of marriage before you're married, uncleanness, immorality, basically, lewdness, debauchery, lustful pleasures, as other translations say, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, strife in the group that you have there, jealousies, Outbursts of wrath or rage. You have rage fits going on. Selfish ambitions. Dissensions and divisions. Heresies. Wrong doctrine being taught. Verse 21, envy. Murders. Selfish ambitions. I said that, right? Verse 21, envy. Murders. Drunkenness. <coughs> Revelries. Wild parties. Orgies. Things like that. I just got to grab something here. Um, and the like, of which I told you beforehand, and just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things, if you're practicing these things, it doesn't mean stumbling once in a while in, 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 in something that's ungodly. We all do that. But if you're practicing such things, doing these things as a way of life, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And, and as we walk in the Spirit, we won't be doing these things at all. We'll be cutting them out. So the works of the flesh are carnal natures, are attitudes that lead to sin. But the fruit of the Spirit is, I want you to notice, it doesn't say, everybody talks, not everybody, but so many talk about the fruits of the Spirit are, that's not it at all. The fruit, singular, the fruit of the Spirit is, again, because it's singular, you can say fruit meaning plural, I understand that. You can say, I'm going to go, go, to, go to town, buy a whole bunch of fruit, meaning a lot of fruits or fruit. So it can be either one, but here it says is. The fruit of the Spirit is. I'm going to talk about how that is singular. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which means really good patience, kindness, goodness, just good people, faithfulness, gentleness. Something I've been working on, or, or I shouldn't say working on, I'm trying, I'm trying to ask God to release these, these things more and more into my, my body, my life. Self-control. Against such there's no law. You're not going to have a law against someone uh, having a peaceful nature and being in self-control. And those who ha are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live in the Spirit... Let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So notice a couple of things. The good fruit of God is the fruit of the Spirit. God's Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is not the fruit of Philip Shields or whatever your name is. The fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit of God's Spirit working in you. And it's not the fruits are, but the fruit is. It's singular. There are nine attributes to the fruit of God, the fruit of God's nature, the fruit of God's spirit. And we find out several times in the Bible that God is love. Now, love is kind of like the all-encompassing fruit. And if you have love, you're going to have joy and peace. You're going to have long-suffering and gentleness and kindness and goodness and all of them. It's one fruit. 
I could hold up an apple, which I brought one now, but on this apple, you have a stem. We have the stem of an apple. We have the skin of an apple. And we have the flesh, the main thing you chew on, you know, once you get a bite in there. And as you take a bite of the apple, there's juice that comes out. And you come to eventually the seeds and the core, okay? You might even come upon a worm, but that's not part of the apple. It's not supposed to be in there. All right, but fruit of the Spirit, we have it all. When you have that apple, you have all of that. You have the seed, the core, the stem, the skin, the juice. You have all of it. It's the same with the fruit of the Spirit. You don't have love without peace. You don't have long-suffering without self-control. Not, not, not with God's nature. The fruit of the Spirit is God's nature. It describes God. And we should have them all, not just some of it. So God, like I said, is love, and the fruit of the Spirit describes God. Um, one of the big things to understand is that the fruit of God's Spirit is the fruit of God working in us. It's the result. It's the fruit of what God is doing in your life, what His Spirit is doing. It's transforming us. It takes time because the seed has to be planted, it has to grow, and all of that. It has to be watered, it has to be nurtured grows up into a tree, and then it's sometimes years before it even has any fruit. But we're more and more growing to become more and more like God. We're being transformed, like Romans 12, 1 and 2 says. Now, I've heard many sermons before from other ministers, and I've given some. So I'm not berating any other ministers. I've done the same thing. Where the focus was on how we've got to work so much harder and strive. It's the word we used to love. We have to strive to become more loving, strive to become more patient, strive to become more joyful, and all of that and so on. But that misses the point. Listen carefully. If I'm striving to become more joyful no matter what's going on, and I can smile and I can look happy, and eventually even feel happy, that's me producing that fruit. That's the fruit of Philip Shields. That's not the fruit of the Spirit. So that misses the point. If we strive to be more patient, that is our fruit. Now, God produces his fruit in us, and we as branches of the vine, we display it, and we extend it out there for others to eat, whether it's a deer coming along or or people who, who pluck my apples, or whatever it is. You may have no, no idea what an apple tree really looks like. You may have never seen an apple tree. But I, I'll almost guarantee I can take most of you. I wouldn't guarantee all of you. But I, you, I could almost guarantee I could take most of you. And if I showed you some trees, and I say, what kind of tree is that? If you could see apples on it, you would say that must be an apple tree because I see apples. And that one over there must be a pear tree because I see pears on it. You see what I'm saying? So a fruit tree bears the evidence of its nature, of its kind. The way we recognize an apple tree is that tree over there with apples on it. The same thing with the children of God. It's a very, very important point. The fruit eventually comes to the branches, shared with others. Uh, the fruit it doesn't eat itself. The, the tree may eat of some of the decaying apples that fall down and become part of the soil and all that. But typically, fruit is for others, okay? Um, now, the fruit also just shows up on the branches. I don't have to go to the, to the food store and buy a bunch of apples and glue them on or wrap them onto the branches. No, I just wait, and in, in its time, in its season, especially if it's getting enough water and sunlight, a tree planted by the rivers of water will produce fruit in its season. We hear that in, Roman, I mean in Psalm chapter 1. The fruit, in other words, are just the natural result of that close union with the tree, the vine, whatever it is. So we aren't the ones producing the fruit. I want to really make sure that's really clear. The vine, the tree does that. We hold the truth, I mean the, the fruit. We, 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 we hold it out there. 
And so the fruit of the Spirit is the result of God living his nature in us. The fruit of the Spirit, just like you identify an apple tree by the apples, identifies who God's people are. Boy, that person is just full of God's love and nature and joyful and peaceful. And, you know, I'm not there yet, but I'm hoping I'm growing to be there more and more. Um, anyway, fruit is for others. I said all that. The apple tree will display the fruit from the inside out. They come from within, not from outside being tacked on, okay? It's not like a Christmas tree, those pagan Christmas trees, that someone from the outside has to adorn, put something on it by someone else's work, okay? Fruit trees aren't like that. No one's putting stuff on it. It comes from within. Important you grasp that and get that in your notes or something because it's going to play, play out here. The fruit's not the result of your hard work or the hard work of the branch. It's the result of the vine and the tree or whatever, and its roots and the, and the chlorophyll and the leaves and the sunshine and all of that. Then in season, the fruit develops. I hope you got that. So I don't want to talk about how we have to work on producing more love, more joy, more peace. We have to work on more patience. A lot of you think I should be talking about that. No, no, no. That would be my work. I've got to make sure you get that. That's totally wrong-headed. We have a part to play, but not that. We don't work on being more kind, okay? We work on something else, as you'll see. Now, fruit from a tree begins with a seed. Remember, Paul says, I planted, in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 4 and 5, I planted, Apollos watered, and God made the fruit. God gave the increase. So ministers can help plant seed. Others can come along and water it, give sermons and things that develop it. But over time, it takes a long time. And God produces the fruit. And he is the one glorified. And so when you're first baptized, we often wonder, well, where's that fruit of God's spirit? Well, if the seed of God's nature has just been planted in you, it's going to take a while. Okay. So be, be patient with that. There's even a verse that's talking about producing fruit with patience, as I'll show you later. And remember what it says in Galatians 5.16, that if you walk in the Spirit, you won't be fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. Uh, when we're acting out the, the works of the flesh, it's absolute proof. We're not close enough to God. We're not letting the Holy Spirit walk through our life. Turn to 2 Corinthians 3, verses 15 to 18. Righteousness, the fruit of the Spirit, is evidence of our closeness with our Lord. 2 Corinthians 3, 15 to 18, and talking about the Jews not understanding the, the truth about Jesus. But even to this day, when Moses is read, in other words, when they read the Torah, a veil lies on their heart. They just don't understand. They don't see it. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord, get this, verse 17, now the Lord, now the Lord is the Spirit. The Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He says very clearly, this Holy Spirit we're talking about, that's actually God working through his nature, through a spirit, a Holy Spirit. There are lots of spirits. Uh, there's angelic spirits, there's the seven spirits, there's different things, but there's only one Holy Spirit. Verse 18. I think that's in Ephesians 4 or something like that, or maybe 5, where it talks about one body, one spirit, and so on. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. See, that's the whole point, by the fruit of the Spirit, and by God's presence in us, we are being transformed into the same image. We're going to look more and more like Jesus. From glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the Lord is the Spirit. We're being transformed by the Spirit of the Lord. I want you to remember that sequence. Now, let's talk about God's Spirit. What is God's Spirit that's producing its fruit? 
I just read 2 Corinthians 3.17. The Lord is the Spirit. It's not a third party, a, a third member of a trinity, all co-equal. They're not co-equal. How many times has, uh, even Paul tells us, I, I, isn't it in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2 or 3, somewhere in there, that the head of man is Christ and the head of Christ is God? And then in 1 Corinthians 15, how when it's all said and done, Yeshua, Christ himself, will bow down. He will bow down. And for God is, is over all, it says. They're not equal. They're not co-equal. And, and there's God and there's Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit from God the Father impregnated Mary. So who would be the father of Jesus? We would normally say, well, by that major, the, it, it, it must be the Holy Spirit. No, it's God the Father using the Holy Spirit, using his nature and all of that. Anyway, it's the fruit of the Spirit we're talking about. The fruit of the Spirit, really, I'm going to show you a lot of evidence now, is really the fruit of Jesus Christ or even our Father who sends out his Spirit, working mightily in us. It's the fruit of God in us. We're being transformed, 2 Corinthians 3.18. So who and what abides in us? Does God himself abide in us? Or is it the Holy Spirit? Or is it both? Okay, John 14.23 Jesus answered and said to them, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. My Father, not just the Father. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. We will abide in you. Go back and read in 1 John 4, 1 John 5. It talks about how God abides in us and how we abide. We make our dwelling in God. It's a two-way street here. But he says, I will and my Father will come live inside of you. That's what he's saying right here in John 14, 23. We'll keep it up there on the screen. Let it really sink in. Well, which is it that comes to dwell in us? God's Spirit or Jesus or God the Father? It's actually God the Father and Jesus who come and live in us, but they do it through the Holy Spirit. You'll see that more and more. When Yeshua said or Jesus said he would not leave them alone, but send the comforter, other translations say helper or counselor. That was the essence of God. That comforter, essence, the helper, the counselor, was God's spirit. The Greek word there for counselor, helper, that I'm going to read some verses on it shortly, is parakletos. Parakletos, meaning the ships that came alongside another ship that was in trouble, and they would try to put the fire out or help get it started again, or, or fix a broken uh, mainsail or whatever. Or they'd bring sick people on board. They would be there to come alongside something that needed help, someone needing help. You should be a paracletos. And as best as I understand it, the Holy Spirit is a total and absolute very essence of God. It's not a separate being. It's not three in one, all co-equal like I've said, and the Holy Spirit is how God will communicate with us. So when you read verses that says the Holy Spirit said, separate Barnabas and Saul, I have work for them to do. Or if the Holy Spirit says, I want you to go into this part of Asia and stay out of that part of Asia, that's God saying those things. But he's saying it through his nature that is so filling to Paul and others that that is what they saw and heard. John 14, verses 15 to 18. God is one speaking through his spirit. John 14, 15 and 18, to 18. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I'll pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. The, the same word, parakletos, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth. Okay, and then in verse 18, he says, 17, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and shall be in you. Verse 18, I will not leave you orphans. I, he just said the helper is going to come. Now here he says, I will come to you. I will come to you. Yes, and he did. And he does. And he still does. He has come to me and to you by the helper, by the Holy Spirit. And then, um, 
uh, John 14, verse 25, 26. Again, he mentions the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He'll teach you all things, help you remember the things I've told you. In verse 26 of John 15, John 15, 26, when the Helper comes, I will send to you from the Father the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. So the Father is the one who sends the Holy Spirit. But it really is um, the essence, very essence, the nature of God, excuse me, the thoughts of God and all of that. Now 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 to 17. So if you were describing God living in you or the Holy Spirit living in you, how would you describe yourself? If they're living in you, you are now the temple of what? The Holy Spirit or the temple of God? Or both? 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. There he is. He's saying you're the temple of God because his nature, his very being, is dwelling in you. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. I'm trying to make the point that when it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, we're really talking about the fruit of God in us. 2 Corinthians 6, 16, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, and I, I will dwell in them. Yeah, you have the Holy Spirit, but God is saying, I will dwell in them. Again, by the Holy Spirit. It is God's power and essence and, and nature and his thoughts and his ability to communicate with you. It's much, much more than just power. But it's not a third element of the Trinity. It just is not. I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and so on. Now, 1 Corinthians 6.19, on the other hand, 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, yes, of course, you are the temple of God, but now you can also say you are the temple of God's Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.19, do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? There's no contradiction. You're the temple of God. And because God works through his spirit and he's putting that in all of us and God and Jesus live inside of us, we're now the temple of the Holy Spirit as well as the temple of God. We're both. There's no contradiction. There's no contradiction. So the fruit of the spirit is really the fruit of God living mightily in you and me. It's the evidence. So that's why we have to get that straight so we understand when we talk about fruit of the Spirit. Now let's kick it up a few notches. In Matthew 7, Jesus warns the disciples against false teachers. False teachers who come in sheep's clothing, not false teachers who come in shepherd's clothing. They come as one of the sheep. They look like sheep. They talk like sheep. But they're like ravenous wolves. Matthew 7, verses 15 to 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes? Of course not, he says. Or figs from thistles? No, he says, even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. This is not talking about the fruit of the Spirit. This is talking about the fruit of our lives, the fruits of our lives. I'm going to say some things now about thistles and thorn bushes that I haven't said before. But I really believe they apply to God and God's Spirit. In Romans 3, we're told there's none good, no, not one. No one. By God's standard of being perfect, we've all sinned. Most of us have sinned a lot. Some have sinned more than others. But by that standard, yeah, there are some people who live better lives than others. I know that. And are more helpful than others. But as far as good by God's standard, there is no one good, no, not one. 
and uh, that, that's told us in uh, Romans 3. I can't remember the verses, but I think verse 10, 11, 12, somewhere in there. I believe Jesus Yeshua is saying the same thing when he talked about thorn bushes and thistles that we learned about during the days of unleavened bread. Once you have a loaf of bread, piece of bread, whatever you have, a leaven cracker or whatever, you cannot take the leaven out of it. You just simply can't take the leaven out of already leavened to bread. We have to start over. We have to chuck that bread. And then we have to bring from the outside bread that's never known leaven. That can't be us because we still are leavened in the sense that even when the two loaves of Pentecost are raised up to God, they are leavened loaves. Now, a leavened loaf is done sinning. A leavened loaf is done leavening. Can't leaven anything else once it's baked and all that, right? Except for maybe uh, uh, sourdough. They, they, I think that can do. <laughs> anyway, so you bring a new bread that has never been leavened. The unleavened bread is not you because we still all sin. We're not trying to show that that new leavened bread shows the new us living sinlessly before we've even received the Holy Spirit, which comes on Pentecost 50 days later. No, that's not the meaning of unleavened bread. And the same thing about these thistles here, I'm going to say. The meaning of unleavened bread is that it pictures Christ, who's never, ever sinned. He's never been leavened. We're picturing eating him and taking him inside of us. If you eat of my flesh, you have life indeed, and so on. Okay, and, and, and so even like I said, the two wave loaves on Pentecost, they're called the first fruits. That refers to us. They're leavened. Not one good. Romans 3, verses 10 to 12. Now, when we're called by God, I believe, comparing it to the analogy of leaven, I maybe shouldn't do that so much, but understand what I'm saying here. We're all, when God calls us, all of us, none of us are good trees. All of us are sinners. All of us are thistle bushes and thorn bushes. All of us. We beg God to replace us with his new seed. Peter talks about having his seed and that we can become begotten or born again. This is the same thing in the Hebrew, in, in, the, in, in the Greek, uh, born, begotten. It's all the same thing, really. You, you know, they, we try to de define, uh, we're already children of God. 1 John 3, now we're the children of God, okay? 1 John 3, verse 1. Whether you're born as a spirit being yet or not, you are already children of God. So don't get into that argument about, about begotten and born and all that. It's a way, time waster. Anyway, we beg God to replace us with that new seed, the new him, his seed, his spirit, his DNA. And he, look at Isaiah 61, verses 2 and 3. And we want him to make us the planting of the Lord. He, we say, we want you to be the planting of the Lord in us. I want myself to be the planting. Isaiah 61, verse 2 and 3, to proclaim the acceptable year of Jehovah. This was read by Jesus in one of the uh, readings he did in the, in, the, in the synagogue. And the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to counsel, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, when God gets involved in our lives as incredible, beautiful things, all these incredible, beautiful things start to happen, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, the planting of Jehovah, that he may be glorified. So the way we become a good tree is, first of all, just ask God to rip out the thistles in my life. Rip out the thorn bushes in my life. Plant in me the planting of the Lord, the trees of righteousness, the planting of Jehovah, that, we, that you may be glorified, O God. Come and live in me, be in me, live in me, speak in me. May I not be a thistle anymore, a thorn bush anymore. So we become a good tree bearing good fruit by what I've just said there. God provides the fruit of himself the fruit of his spirit. I think a verse that is so misused by so many in the Church of God groups, the Hebrew Roots groups, Messianic groups, 
Philippians 2.12. Yeah, well, Philip, you know what? You got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, no less. You got to work out your own salvation. I am not my savior. Neither are you your savior. You're certainly not mine. You and I have the same savior and it's Yeshua. So what does this mean? Everybody reads Philippians 2.12, but then they don't read the next verse. Start 12 again. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, now in my presence, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. Prove it. Work it out. Show it that you really are being saved with fear and trembling. Take it seriously, he's saying. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. The desire to do good, the desire to actually do it, is God working in you. It's not you working it out. It's God's working out your salvation. God is saving you. So please understand the fruit of the Spirit is God's working in us. So the fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. It's the Spirit's fruit not fruit of your efforts. I referred earlier, 1 Corinthians 3, 5 to 7, let's post it up again, that uh, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, verse 6, God gave the fruit, God gave the increase. So the planter and the waterer, they're nobody, but all the glory goes to God, he says. Acknowledge if your good tree has become dormant, non-productive, it's very dangerous. Ask God to help bring it back to life help bring you back to life, to help you stop the things that are making the fruit be choked. So you see, as Paul explained in Galatians 5 that we read earlier, we still have the nature of the false works of the flesh. We, have, we still have that nature fighting God's nature. But as I read earlier in Galatians 5, 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay, And because of not walking in the Spirit, you you're, you're end up not doing the things you want to do. So what's the big key on how? I've been kind of saying it already, but how do we produce and show and display? How is the fruit of God's Spirit shown in our lives? Be turning to John 15. Most of John 15 is all about the how this happens. There's a winery or vineyard near us called Lake, Lake Ridge uh, Winery or vineyard, whatever it's called there. And we've also visited uh, some in Napa Valley, California. And our webmaster does such a great job for all of you and his wife, Brandy. Uh, uh, they, they took some pictures in all of vineyards in LJ, LJ, is that whatever that is. I'm going to read right through John 15, verses 1 to 5, and then verse 8, and then verse 16. And then we'll come back, and at that time we'll see more pictures. Jesus is going to talk about branches that have no fruit, branch, branches that have some fruit, branches that then start bearing more fruit, and then some that are much fruit, and then some that have fruit that doesn't spoil or doesn't get ruined, fruit that remains. John 15, verse 1 to 5, I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. He's the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch, I'm going to come back to that because there's a lot about that. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it bears more. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me. Now notice how many abides are going to come up. Abide means it's similar to the word abode. Make me your dwelling place. Dwell in me. Stick to me. Soak me into your life. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot. We're the branches. We just read that. In verse 5, I'm the vine, you're the branches. But anyway, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides, dwells in, stuck to, clings to, is part of that vine. That's what abide means. You're part of it. Neither can you unless you abide, live, dwell, get stuck to me. 
I'm that vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, dwells in me, and I in him bears much fruit. Therein is the whole secret. For without me, you can do nothing. Are you abiding in Christ? Some of you don't even pray every day, not even one time. You're hardly abiding if that's the case. And abiding is much more than just praying when you first get up or praying when you go to bed. Abiding means you're aware of his presence. You're walking in the spirit. You're soaking in Yeshua all day long. You're making contact to Abba in heaven, our father, our dear daddy. Many, many times, no matter what you're doing, you just, even just a few seconds, and, and just in a whispered prayer or just in your mind, Father in heaven, I need help with this next decision I have to make or this person I'm about to see. May your glory shine in this meeting. And you're abiding when you do that. But if you never bring up God, talk about God, think about God, talk to God, I don't mean texting God. Many of you would text God. <laughs> No, talk to him. Okay, if you abide in me, you bear much fruit. Verse 5. Without me, you can't do very much. You can't do anything. Verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. Verse 8. Father wants a lot of fruit. Much fruit. Verse 16. You didn't choose, choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Notice how many times he's talking about fruit and abiding, that your fruit should remain, that you keep producing it, doesn't run out, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Now let's go back. Verse 1, I am the vine, you are the branches. Father's the gardener who takes care of it all. He's the one who prunes and works with each of us. But the one we're supposed to stick to is Jesus, is Yeshua. Yeshua means Savior. Jesus does too, I guess. It's the English version of the Greek, Jesus. Verse 2 is very interestingly worded. I haven't seen some of this before. Verse 2, let's read what it says. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch in me. Now, you cannot be a branch in Jesus Christ without the Holy Spirit already. I want you to understand what I'm saying here. You cannot be in Jesus Christ without the Holy Spirit putting you there into it, uh, into him. Now, they don't bear fruit. He takes away but, or, or removes or cuts off or whatever the, your translation says. But very interestingly, in my New King James, there's an asterisk right beside the words takes away. And it says, and when I click on the asterisk in my laptop, it says, or lifts up. Now the English Standard Version also has an asterisk and it has probably three or four paragraphs. If you have an English Standard Version Bible or can look it up on the uh, in a Bible hub or something like that. The ESV. Let me come back to that again. Is it takes away or is it lifts up? And this is something not bearing fruit at that moment. But it's a, it's a branch that's in me. Verse 2 says that. There are poles and support systems to keep the branches off the ground. In a well-tended vineyard, you won't see branches, live branches on the ground. They want the branches off the ground. They want the branches out of the dirt. Those in the dirt get stepped on. Those in the dirt can't get much sunshine, blocked by everything above them. They become unfruitful. And we are the branches. God does not want us in the dirt. Whether the branch is taken away or cut off or is it lifted up, it's getting God's attention somehow. But notice again, the branch is in me. I want to keep saying that. I think that's huge. Over and over, he tells us to abide in him. Now he says, here's this branch in me, but somehow it's not producing fruit. So what's going on here? Nobody can be in Christ without the Holy Spirit baptizing you into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 and 13. For as the body is one, the church body is one, and has many members, but all the members 
of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into. The in me part. We were all baptized by God's Spirit into the one body. Who's the one body? Romans 12, 5. We, being many, are one body in Christ. He's the body. Colossians 1, 18. Christ is the head of the body, the church. He's the body. And we're baptized, we're immersed, we're put into the body by God's Spirit. So what's going on here with that branch? And does it mean cut off? Does it mean that? Almost all translations say that. But I'd like you to look it up in your original Greek. The words take away or cut off or whatever. That first branch was in him and wasn't bearing fruit. It had become unfruitful. Yeshua says that in the parable of the sower, if we're, if we're not careful, the seed that's planted can, can either be taken away by the devil and his demons, pictured by the birds in the parable, or they can uh, be on the rocks and then not have enough root, and when persecution comes, they can't last. Or they can go into the thorns, and the word of God is choked. Let me read it out of Luke 8. The other passage is uh, Matthew 13, I believe. But Luke 8, verses 14 to 15, the ones, or seeds, that fell among the thorns are those who, when they've heard, go out, but are choked. They start to grow, but are choked with cares. Riches, thinking about money and riches and investments. Should I buy silver or gold? Should I buy Bitcoin? Should I buy this stock or that stock? Should I retire or am I ready? Riches, they will choke you, if that's your focus, and pleasures of life. I know people who they have to go every single day, go golfing and then end up with a happy hour someplace. And they bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and a good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. So it takes time to bear that fruit, but they're not giving up. They're not giving up. So it's clear in John 15, too, that this branch that Jesus says was in him is, depending how you translate the next word, for taken away or removed, this branch is either taken away, and the word can also in the Greek and often is translated in the Greek as lifted up. The Greek word is A-I-R-O. Let's post that. A-I-R-O, number 142. And it's translated almost universally in many translations on this verse, at least, as cut off, removed, or taken away. But the Greek word aero, if I'm pronouncing it right, is so often also translated lifted up or took up. So, for example, it says in... Um, John, that the people picked up, they, they lifted up some stones to stone Jesus. Same word, arrow. And then there's another verse about the ship's anchor was lifted up. It was down there, it was lifted up, arrow again. And so which one is it? So all I know is there have been times in my life, after I was in Christ, when I became unfruitful, unproductive, very down on myself, down in the dirt, down in the dumps. Did God just cut me off and cast me out? I promise you, no. There are things that happened, but I think God encouraged me, lifted up my spirits. Now, if I decide in moments like that to finally just give it up, throw it all away, and I reject God's spirit, I'm not going to bear any fruit ever, ever. I don't want God's Spirit. At that point, I will be cut off. But I think many of us have experienced the times when God will work through others. My wife encouraged me. There were others who encouraged me when I was down in the dumps, thinking I'm no good for anything now. So when that happens in a vineyard, some branches are on the ground. They will get trampled. They're in the dirt. Little sunshine. That branch can either be cut off or it can be lifted up. It's still alive. They can pick that up or they can cut it off. If you're wondering why you see little fruit in your life, maybe you're spending way too much time in the dirt. In the dirt of this world. 
And you need to be lifted up out of that to where the sunshine is. Let God redirect you and get you back on the top. We'll show you pictures of vineyards and how they have these trellises and things and ropes and wires and that support the various vines. And they want them up. They don't want them down. The Greek word arrow can be either interpretation. When I look it up in the word study dictionary of the New Testament, number 142 arrow, it says to take up. The first definition, to take up, to lift up, to raise. You know, if you, if, if you pick up a serpent, it won't hurt you. Mark 16, 18. That's not cut off a serpent. If you pick up a serpent, John 8, 59, if they picked up stones from the ground and so on, anchors, Acts 27. But then the same Bible dictionary later on gives some example where's, where the word is used to mean cut off. So there you have it. I know my God is super patient. I know my God has covenanted with me that if I give you my Holy Spirit, Philip, what's your name? Jesus will finish what he started in you. I'm giving you my Arab bone, my earnest of my Holy Spirit. It's like an engagement ring, which is in, in Greece is Arabona. I, we heard that. We saw that ourselves with our own eyes in Athens. God is covenanted that if you have started with me, I'm going to keep working with you. I might have to put you through trials and tests and things to wake you up. But I'm not just going to just cut you off so quick. Please. Now, those of us who are producing some fruit, he will prune. Pruning is never probably feel, never probably feels good, but I prune some of my flowers. I wish I'd taken some pictures to show you before and after. I can show you, you know, like, like we have a hibiscus got hit by, by even here in Florida, got hit by, um, uh, what do you call it, the real cold temperatures, the frost, and killed a lot of the plant and the, the flowers. I had to cut it down, but now it's blooming beautifully again. Now, sucker branches don't do any good. They're ugly. Those have to be cut off. They don't produce any fruit. Cut them off. But the biggest key to producing much fruit it's going to be one word, and we've read it over and over in, Acts, in John 15. You know what the word is? Abide. Dwell in me. Stick to me like you've been glued on, tacked on. Hang out with me. Soak me in. I like to be intimate. Yeshua, Christ, is saying to us, you know you get the fruit of the womb, which is a child, right? It's another use of fruit. There's fruit of repentance. There's fruit of the womb and all that. But you can't have a fruit of the womb just by talking about it. You can't have the fruit of God's Spirit just by once in a while reading the Bible, once in a while talking to Him. You have to soak Him in. Walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Soak Him in. Have Him with you all the time. Do I do that perfectly? No. No. Am I doing it better and better? There's some days I do it really well, and the day goes so well. And there are days I don't do it well at all. Horrible days. And I'm much more prone to give in to temptation or do things I'm ashamed of or something in my life, the way I talk or see or react or whatever. So you know to get the fruit of a womb, you can't just talk intimacy. You can't just talk to each other, talk about it to produce that fruit of the womb, you have to have some intimacy. The Bible calls it getting to know his wife. And the Bible is very blunt. It talks about going into. This man went into whatever. And uh, Isaac went into Rebekah, whatever. I'm not trying to... The Bible, that's, those are Bible words. But fruit of the womb is only possible by con intimate contact. The fruit of God's Spirit is intimate contact, okay? Not just talking about it. There has to be intimacy. I'll give you an example in Genesis 4, verses 1 to 1 and 2. Now, Adam knew his wife. Now, when the Bible talks about when God, when someone knows his wife, it means they're really getting to know each other. And she conceived. He was intimate with her, and she conceived and bore the fruit of the womb. Uh, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I've acquired a man from Jehovah, from the Lord. 
And then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. So that, that's my point. We have to be intimate to get that fruit coming. I think Cain and Abel very possibly were twins, by the way. If you read of all the other uh, births, it always says the, the, the mother conceived and then bore. But here she conceived and bore Cain and then bore again. There's no conceived here the second time. So I'm thinking it's possible that Cain and Abel were twins. And she probably thought the older, the firstborn, they knew that there was going to be someone coming down there from their seed who would save the world. And she probably thought it was Cain. But it wasn't Cain. Anyway, our hard work and focus is not trying so hard to work out our own salvation. It's God who works in you, remember, both to will, that's to want to do, and to do, according to his good pleasure. If you read Philippians 2.12, start reading verse 13 with it, please. Otherwise, you're crediting yourself with being a do-it-yourself savior, and you, you're not. I promise you, you're not. So our hard work is not trying to be so hard to be patient, kind, and loving, and joyful, but spend more time throughout the day, constant contact, abiding in him, dwelling in him, soaking him in. If you're not doing that, you cannot bear fruit. John 15, 4, you cannot. You have to stay attached. Verse 15, again, 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides, dwells in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. Without me, you can't do anything. And if you seek Yeshua, he will help you. There's a story in Luke 13 that a certain man had a fig tree. This is encouraging, I hope, to us when we feel like, I'm not bearing the fruit of God's Spirit. Well, start abiding. Start cutting out the time wasters. Time is short. Much less TV, much less social media. Cut it out. That's not going to save you. That's going to hurt you. Spend more time in God's Word. Spend more time praying. Spend more time with God's children, talking about the things of God. But if you're feeling you need to be more fruitful, this, verse should, this passage should encourage you. A certain man had a fig tree in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and found none, maybe because he felt all alone there, all these vines, and I'm the only fig. I, I don't know. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, look for, th I, look, for three years I've coming down looking for fruit. I find none, not a single fig. Cut it down. Why is it taking up space here? Why is it encumbering up the, soil, the, the ground? But this, um, the keeper, the gardener said, sir, please let alone one more year. Until let, let me dig around it, cultivate around it, fertilize it. Work with it. And if it doesn't bear fruit after that, fine. We'll cut it down. This says if we're not bearing fruit, there are efforts being made to bring us back to life. Philippians 1.6, he will finish what he started in us. So what's eating up your time? What's distracting you? What's eating up all your time? Notice those things. Uh, that do bear fruit, bear it with patience. It will take time and cut out time wasters. Remember, trees can take years to bear fruit. And the early fruits on any tree, when it first starts, they're hard. They're not pretty. They're sour. They're not edible. So it takes a while to have that luscious fruit. Again, notice it's singular. The fruit of the Spirit is not fruits of the Spirit are. You get one, you get them all. If God is in us, all of God's nature will be showing in us, not just a part of it. You won't have fits of rage and lust and anger and uh, drunkenness and all of that and somehow have God's love. It's let, it, let God flow in you. So God is love. God is joy. Okay, all of that. The evidence of the fruit of God's Spirit is the life that glorifies God not ourselves. The fruit is internal. The fruit wants to bring glory to God, not ourselves. The fruit wants to show focus on God, not ourselves. People are impressed with you. Point it back up to God every time. Now, don't, one more thing I want to finish up here with. Ooh, it's longer than I usually go, but 
It's important. Fruit of the Spirit is not the same as gifts of the Spirit. That's a whole different topic. Fruit of the Spirit is God's nature that we get from being directly connected deeply all day long, day and night with Christ. I'm saying, I wake up middle of the night, I pray. Right there in my bed. I don't even have to get out of bed. I'll just pray to God, pray, pray to Jesus, pray to God the Father, talk to them. Something's on my mind. David, in many of the Psalms, says in the middle of the night, he, he was meditating on God's law. He was praying. He was talking to God. He was singing. So day and night, as you wake up, just make constant contact for a few seconds with God. I like to listen to the Bible as I'm getting ready for bed. And then I'll play that chapter over and over and over again until I really know it. Then I'll go to the next chapter. Anyway, the fruit of the Spirit is simply describing God himself. The gifts of the Spirit, on the other hand, uh, the gifts are things you never had before. God is gifting you with an ability to be able to serve him and the brethren. Gifts like wisdom, a kind of wisdom you didn't have. Knowledge, faith, and miracles. Now you can do miracles. That's a gift. Preaching or prophesying. Some people have real gifts of prophesying and preaching. Healing. Not every minister has gifts. I've had some people healed that I've prayed for and many who were not. But the gifts of healing, generosity, speaking in other languages, tongues. So don't mix it up with God's fruit. But God's gifts are wonderful too. Anyway, the fruit is just staying attached to God and then he will, in his time and his way, begin to show others that you are his child. Because just like that apple tree, I know it's an apple tree because I see apples. And when people see the fruit of God's nature in you, they will know you're a child of God. Father, we thank you. We dismiss now. We just ask you to please, please pour out your Holy Spirit. Help us learn what it means to abide in you, that that's the hard work we have to do. Abide in you, in Jesus Christ. Abide in you. And then you will produce your nature in us. If you abide in me and I in you, then you will bear much fruit. Yeshua, that's what you said. So we take you at your word and help us to, in the time that's remaining in this life, really glorify you and show people that you are the true one living God and that you live in your children. We love you, Father. Thank you for all your blessings. Uh, guide and protect your people. And protect them from the devil, the demons that want to hurt him. There's a real warfare out there going on. And it's not those people, Father. They're going to be our brothers someday. The real war we face, and help us all to understand it, it's not people. It's the spirits behind those people. Evil spirits. And we have you. We have God. We have you in us. And he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Thank you so much, dear Father. We commit this now to you, and we thank you for all your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website, where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.